quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Hello, you're listening to the podcast. So there I was. It's how all great aviation tales begin. Fig. And we need uh, to have a talk. <laughs> That's what this one's called. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we need to have a talk? Proof that one should probably never leave their camera laying around in a naval aviation ready room. Just saying. Advice. <laughs> well, the same could be said now for cell phones, but this was pre-cell phone days. It, it was indeed. Sponsor this week is Babbel. They've come back again to sponsor the show. Thank you very much, Babbel. They have the great offer available at babbel.com slash so there I was for 55% off your language learning journey. We'll talk more about that during the show. Muchas gracias, Babbel. Por supuesto que sí. <laughs> Hey, one other admin note we need to talk about, Vic, is Christmas holidays coming up for us. First of all, to anybody celebrating any holiday coming up, we hope you enjoy some time with your family and get a chance to, uh, shameless plug, go to our merch store and get something cool for your family from our merch store. So there I was at US slash merch. Bikini. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, seriously, that wasn't where I was going with this. Here's the thing. We are actually, we've got, we've got good news and bad news. The good news is you aren't going to hear us for a couple of weeks over the Christmas holidays, right? The bad news is we're going to be back in January. Wait a minute. I, th I thought that was the good news. <laughs> you told me that was the good news. Yeah. Well, there's that. No, you're going to have to keep listening to us. We're coming back, but we're going to try and take a couple of weeks off. We've gone 84 shows straight here, right? So, yeah. It's it, it's time for us to take about a two week break. We'll put some best of shows back up. I don't know yet, but I'm thinking maybe Royce Williams, who shot like, down four MIGs. I like that one again. Yeah, yeah, that was a good show. And we'll find another one. And we've got some exciting guests lined up coming your way. Hey, let's talk more about Sluggo here. An E two C Hawkeye driver. That's a that's, that's our a first f Hawkeye. That's a first. It's a first. Yeah. He had great stories as. You would expect of right. a naval aviator or any aviator for that matter. But, you know, one who lands on a boat, because it's easy to land on a boat. Well, you know, there's four flare, wires. How hard can it wire. be? How, how can you miss? <laughs> <laughs> that's one of oh, our Gringo's favorite. That's one of my favorite lines from I know, right? want to <laughs> land on a carrier. <laughs> how hard is it? It's four yeah. wires. You, you never have, have to flare. flare. Yeah, you just hit the damn boat. <laughs> there's never a crosswind. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, he uh, yeah, he was unless doing Unless your master trying to get Yogi back aboard. And, oh, and my gosh. He says, I'll take the wind. Straighten up the damn boat, yeah. boss. <laughs> oh, Sluggo had a whole bunch yeah. of great stories. Uh, he, he did indeed. Including um, the title. We, yeah. Well, we got to tease the one in the title. Midshipman on board the ship leaves his camera behind while he goes flying on his first class crew, second class crew, something like that. Well, he's yep. between years at the Naval Academy. Oops comes back many years later and is flying with the gent who was in that squadron and explains what might have happened with that camera. <laughs> and <laughs> Let's leave it at that. <laughs> Ooh, it at not that. pretty. Yeah, also, so, uh, Slogo was a NAVCAD. It was. One of the NAVCADs that had good timing right before the riff happened. Right? Had he stayed in college and gone through as an AOCS normal cad, <laughs> normal officer candidate, he might have wound up in that riff. So yeah. good for him. Uh, like Seabass. Seabass uh, yeah. was a little, just a little behind him and got caught in the riff. Yep. Of course, uh, yeah. that enabled him to become a Marine. Arr, uh, so that worked, uh, out. that worked out to his advantage, I'm right, sure. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So... But he had some great stories from primary flight school. Everybody's getting a great on wing. He winds up with the knob in the bunch. And oh, yeah. <laughs> that sucked for him. And he said, he, you know, he thinks that's part of why he wound up going in the prop community. But I'll tell you what, those guys are no slouches. You're flying that E2C. That was the largest wingspan going aboard a carrier. No room for error. Not that there was much room for guys who had a smaller wingspan, but. No. No, you're right. And it, it's an important mission. Uh, and that he'll, that he'll talk about as well. The E2 has an important mission. A pretty cool mission when you think about it, things it can do. Well, that, he, had, he had a very colorful career. Right. And he uh, tells great stories. Absolutely. But I got to mention this too. Talk about stones, man. We always get, give guys that fly helos crap. Man, that's a whirling death trap. We can auto rotate. You, you know, you were in a jet that hovered and if the engine, yeah, we could eject. 
Not me too, too you're not. You're riding it all the way down. <sighs> you're in it. You're in a boat. Yeah, you're you're going on and off the boat with no ejection seat. Terrifying. Yeah. And as a rag instructor, which he was, you yes. had to ride with your student when they went to the boat, which is freaking crazy. Yeah. So that was another title we considered for the show was one of those stories, the story of him riding with the student going aboard the boat. <laughs> do you want to call it a day or yeah. do you want to get back on the horse? Yeah. <laughs> and the student's like, what? Yeah, what? Yeah. That was a little off. A little Dude, off. you almost killed me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know. My palms were sweating when he told that story. Right. Did all kinds of stuff. Air, air show demo pilot. Just, you know what? Instead of hearing us knuckleheads talk about Let's get out of the way. Let's get out of the way. Let hey, the gnome hey. skull tell it himself. <laughs> Let him tell it. Let Sluggo talk. Here We're comes Sluggo. Uh, let's see. No ejection seat handle. No collective. Oh, dear oh. God. I don't know what to tell you people to do. Sit back and listen. So, good luck. Cockpit. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> On the tanker, through the weather. Oh, and to the uh, tanker crew who uh, did that. Thanks a lot. We really appreciated that. I'm just kidding. No, well, there I was crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fun. So there I was somewhere between, I don't know, the burble and the ramp, Clara, thinking the LSOs are going to wave me off any second now. And then we came to a screeching halt, and I realized, well, I guess they're not. Clara is not your friend. No. That is how all great aviation tales begin. Welcome, everybody. This is Repeat here, coming to from you, coming to you from New Hampshire or something along those lines today. Where's my co-host? I'm in Kearney, Missouri, just outside Kansas City. Woo! Outstanding, and we have with us today E two C two Hawkeye pilot extraordinaire Sluggo, Welcome, and you're coming Sluggo. from Wisconsin, I believe, right, sir? You betcha. Awesome. Welcome, Sluggo. Clara, between the ramp and the burble. Oh, dear God. <laughs> hey, just just so uh, we can There's be There's some clear, terms. Clara. Yeah. I know we talked about this before, yeah. but Sluggo, what does Clara mean? Clara means you can't see a damn thing <laughs> outside the cockpit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> There's no ball on the lens. It's so, it's either, it's so far off one way or the other that you can't tell. Not good. So welcome, Sluggo. You, how'd you, uh, let's start at the beginning. The earth was void and without form, and you decided you wanted to fly airplanes. How, how'd that go? Well, I, I grew up out in the boonies of Western Maryland before the internet, so not a lot of aviation around. There was a little dinky airport in Cumberland that to this day I've never even been to, shockingly. My dad was a mech. My dad was a mech back in their ADRs and ADTs. So he worked on the old piston pounder helos. So when I went to flight school, they told me, don't go helos, too many moving parts. And my great uncle actually has a, a DFC, a Distinguished Flying mm -hmm. Cross. He was the first American to eject from an airplane. First Sergeant Larry Lambert punched out of a P-61 August 17th of 1946. Wow. So, on on. On purpose, like a test. <laughs> On or, purpose, they, they probably paid him like an extra ten bucks, I guess. Um, he was test. He was the actual live test he, ejection seat. He test. was he, the crash he, test he, dummy, huh? Oh my he god, was, he was a guinea pig. So I, I don't know if those stories really. I'm I'm guessing that planted the seed. So long as I can remember, I wanted to uh, fly navy. I, I mentioned to my dad one day. I, I I was reading about the A10. I said that A10's pretty cool. And, it was a one-way conversation. I said, "All right, I guess I'll. I guess I won't do that. I'll. I'll stay in the Navy." <laughs> and uh, that would have been a great airplane, yeah. actually, for the Navy and the Marine Corps to have. But just could, weird. Yeah. Couldn't land on an aircraft carrier and fold its wings up. Yeah. yeah. And and did you know your great uncle? Did not. He died before I was born. But I oh, heard, okay. heard some stories. I thought maybe he uh, get, uh, told you about the ejection seat, and then therefore you. <laughs> Non-ejection seat so airplane. I, yeah, <laughs> that thing's awful. Try yeah. to fly something without that goes off a carrier without an ejection seat. I said, "All right." That's more terrifying than flying helicopters, I think. Right? <laughs> yeah. 
because yeah, right. holy cow, there is such a, you're, it's a small window, but there's a period of vulnerability in there where you are just screwed if anything goes wrong. So hats off to those guys that do that. Oof, amazing. And what's the normal, let me back up a little bit. How, how many folks in the back on a standard group for an E2? A max of three. Okay. So if we're doing like a pilot training flight, you'd have one guy in the back. A lot of the counter drug we did, we'd take two guys. But if you're doing something with the air wing, we'd have a full crew with three guys in the back. And they'd basically do the job of an AWACS crew back there. They were, it was a thing to watch. I was in some good squad and some really good NFOs. And they do an amazing job back there, just the three of them. But, yeah, that is astounding. The for, And for those that aren't familiar, go, go Google it. But the E-2 is a twin turboprop aircraft with a great big radar dish mounted on the back it's like a disc yeah hey what's the mission of that i mean i know can you explain what the mission of the e2 is for our non-aviator listeners they say command and control basically anything airborne around the carrier we've got our i guess our fingers in the pie we're controlling all the air wing assets we're monitoring anything airborne around the air wing really good guys could find targets on the ground you have to kind of tweak the system now the new advanced hawk i don't know a ton about it but that thing just really does a ton of stuff i think you need like a secret clearance just to step into the daggone thing um, <laughs> right <laughs> about that so there it is if you're watching on on the interwebs, I've got a picture of the the gents uh, that fly it and uh, the airplane up there in the background. Hey, Slogo, uh, that big air intake that's on top of the fuselage behind the cockpit there, is that uh, to, for the extra cooling of their yeah. of the E&E &E equipment from all the... Yeah, that's the vapor cycle stuff. to okay. cool all the boxes for the radar and stuff in the back end. Wow. Yeah, I don't remember seeing one of those on a C2. Yeah. I don't think they, right? I don't think yeah. they have that scoop. They, they just threw it on there to, like, this plane is just not quite ugly enough. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Mr. Potato Head airplane. Let's throw something else on here. Well, what was your, so, commissioning source, or how did you get to AOCS? Let's talk about that. I was an AFCAD. I, I, uh, it's funny, my, my mom had high hopes for me to go to the Naval Academy. I, I don't think I had the brain power. I, I surely didn't have the, desire to do four years at the Naval Academy. So I knew I wanted to do AOCS because I wanted aviation and nothing else. And as luck would have it, and I to this day I can't remember, somebody I ran into, again, just before the internet, said something about, well, I heard Navy really wants engineering, math backgrounds, and I was a pharmacy major. Just figured it'd be a good backup in case I didn't make it in. And... So I called the local recruiters at the Country Club Mall, and they said, "We don't, we don't deal with officers. You got to call Pittsburgh." So I called Pittsburgh, and they said, "Hey, we got this new program called NavCat. You can come in after your sophomore year of college." And I thought, "Well, I I want to finish up, have it completed, have my school done before I went in." And I remember laying in bed that night thinking, "Hey, knucklehead, this is what you want to do. Why put it off? You don't know. A lot of stuff could happen." Right. In the meantime, so I called the next day and I said, uh, sign me up. Let's go to NAFCAD. And, and luckily I did because had I finished pharmacy school, I'd have been trying to come in during the drawdown. And, you know, they're oh, moving guys out. Yeah. So. Right. So, so when was that, Slugo? When did you uh, get in the NAFCAD program there? I got accepted fall of 88, went to AOCS in February of 89. With, I found out later, broken leg. <laughs> How about that? Did you have one of those Wait, did you get fractures in your uh, Stress shoot? fracture there at uh, AOCS, or did you bring it in? I brought to... it in. I thought it'd be a great idea to do a last ski trip with a buddy of mine. And, Shit. Yeah, because, you know, I was thinking. Always thinking ahead. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Smart 20-year-old. <laughs> and Wow. They, they, they took me off the hill in, a, in the toboggan. I thought, oh, it's broken. Took my boot off, and then it felt fine all of a sudden. They took x-rays at Podunk Little Hospital, and, oh, yeah, you're good. And showed up and... Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
And, you know, frickin' Marine Gunnies, they love to run. They got... Weird. Yeah, they need some other hobbies. And, uh, right on. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this leg feels a little little painful. And then it got worse and worse. Got to the point where I could tell my, my pulse at night because the throbbing in my in my leg. Oh. But... <laughs> My my family had already bought their airline tickets to Pensacola for graduation. Oh shit! So I couldn't. You know, I'm like, well, I can't roll out of this class. I'm quitting I, now. They're, they're yeah. gonna. Those change fees are steep. That's right. And so I just muscled through, and and it wasn't good. And the DI was up my ass, and I'm running like I had a bucket on my foot, and and luck, luckily made it through. And years later, I was in a, a mountain bike wreck, and they said, well, your leg's okay, but you know you had a, a fracture in whatever the small bone is. Um, I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. I can't there remember. But, but the small bone. And that's when I found out years later that, oh, yeah, you had a, you had a broken bone there that he I was like, well, that explains the pain. Oh, man. I'm guessing that would be the fibula. I don't know if Sticks is watching or not. He's our resident tip medical fib. expert. It's got to be. The small one's the fib. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Nice. That's right. Oh, my God. That sounds treacherous, so, to say the least. And then, was uh, Gunny, hey, was Gunny Go already gone in 89? He would have been, yeah, because I left I left okay. missile, Hawk Missiles in 87, and he was already there. So okay. we had him on. Semper Fi, do or die. Well, Episode 14 to 17, somewhere in there. Money. Gunnery Sergeant Goforth had a uh, long and distinguished career, most of which was on the parade deck of either AOCS in Pensacola, Paris Island, South Carolina, or Quantico, Virginia, torturing officer candidates and new recruits. Right. <laughs> With his comedic... <laughs> well, they're all, they're, all, they're all damn comedic. Oh, they are. For crying out loud. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Well, the funny thing is, my RDI, he was a mech. So he and my dad were having a long conversation at graduation. He's right. Like, oh, he's a hell of a guy. Yeah, he, he's a hell of a guy. Nice. Yeah, he's a hell of a guy. <laughs> yep. And do you remember his name? Gunny Woodard. Nice. He asked me at graduation. He came up and he said, so what's wrong with your leg? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Only slightly broken. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so as yeah. a NAVCAD, we we uh, we've had a couple other Marquettes. Actually, we've had several yeah. NAVCADs. Marquettes and uh, NAVCADs and yeah. Some from the Vietnam era and then some from, you know, your era. So who so there was a Marine uh, call sign Harrier pilot. Remember he was a NAVCAD and he was in he he got helos and then he got halfway through the helo training, they said, yeah. "Hey, sorry. Thanks for your support, but we're rip we were we riffed him. They riffed him." Yeah. And that was, yeah, we'll keep going here. I'll figure out who that was in a minute. Yeah, C- anyway. Was that Seabass? Uh, Seabass. Yeah, it was Seabass. Yeah. Yes. So. so obviously, I think he was slightly behind you. I heard that. I yeah, I, I think, think, he was, think he was behind me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. The timing was good. Slow go. So It was good. And you made it. My, so my, made luck it? Is, my luck is very good and very bad. It just depends. Well. You made you made it out of AOCS, broken leg at all. Right. You wound up uh, in flight school. Did you do Milton, or did you get down to Corpus Christi? Where'd you go? BT two of Milton. Okay. Again, where my luck was very good, very bad. I had go through ground school, went great. Started all my buddies were getting phone calls from their on wings. Hey, I'm going to be your on wing. Why don't you come by the house for a barbecue? Hey, I'm your on wing. Why don't you meet me at the club for a beer? And my phone wasn't ringing. So I so I called my guy up and I said, "Hey, yeah, uh, Navcat Cook, yeah. Well, there'll be a new on wing, okay." I said, "Well, what if you could, you know, maybe recommend a few things to study?" It's like, "Yeah, everything, okay." And we started flying, and and oh my god, this guy was a lunatic, <sighs> screaming and yelling and throwing stuff and. He, he had a neat trick. The ball would get a little out of trim, so we'd stomp on the rudder and bang your head off the canopy. And Fun times. Oh, it was great. I'd never flown knob. before. Never flown before. Yeah. So finally downed me on FAM 4 for Atlantics. <laughs> and I think I had accrued like 10 belows and, and a down by FAM 4. All, all from your on-wing. From my on-wing. 
Thanks, asshole. They booted yeah. him. They finally booted him. I found out. But I got a, I got my new on wing. I know you, I got to mention names. Jim Tingle, if he's listening, great right. American, forty six Bubba. He was my my the, the the hand out of the darkness. I I got paired up with Jim, and the first thing he said was, "Yeah, I heard you heard you know so and so is your on wing." I, I said, heard yeah, you he suck. Goes, <laughs> he goes. Uh, he said, who, who, your odd wing was so-and-so. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, he's an asshole. Nobody likes him. And I was like, oh, okay. And so we take off, first flight with him, and it was silent. I thought the ICS went out. So we're, we're flying along. Yeah, I, I finally ke- keyed the mic, and I said, sir? He goes, yeah. I said, oh. Because by that point, it would have just been screaming and yelling. And... This is completely foreign to you at this point completely. because, right? You normally it's you, I, I need some corrective input from, here. <laughs> oh my god! So, so he said, "Hey, I'm I'm going to keep you on wing with me for a little bit because of your situation with your first knucklehead." And I said, "That's fine with me." So the second day I show up, there's a marine standing there, and the VT two marines had a reputation, and, and he said, "I changed my mind. I got somebody I want you to fly with." I'm like, "You son of a bitch." <laughs> yeah, you set me up, and and again I mentioned him, McCollum, Captain McCollum. I think he's another frog, Bubba. And it stuck with me. He goes, he goes, John, what's what's the first rule of flying? And I said, don't, don't crash. Die. Yeah, and he, goes, <laughs> he goes, no man, have fun. You can tell the accent. He was from I'm, I'm guessing Boston, somewhere in the Northeast. He's like, no man, have fun. He said, you know what we're gonna do today? I'm like. Have, have fun, fun? <laughs> yeah yeah man so we went out and he that was he introduced me to cloud surfing and nice. uh, we went out and i learned more stick and rudder from from those two guys in two days and i had learned obviously in the first four flights fly with with uh, knucklehead and from then the, the switch the switch came on and and the rest of the rest of primary went went great but because I ended up pulled myself mostly out of the hole, finished FAMS with one net below. Nice. And okay. They they wouldn't let me go tail hook, but they let me go E twos because I had I had pretty good jet grades by the time I finished, even starting in the hole. So I thought I was good to go until I went in to tally things up, and that's when I got the you know how that goes. Hey, new rule, new rule this week. So. Yeah. Uh, so they let me go Hummers and ended up in some great squadrons, but the, but the rest of primary was fun. I, I, on my solo being a, you know, again, forward thinking 20 year old, I got, you know, they give you all your books when you check in. So I had all my formation aerobatics and that before my solo, I went through my aerobatic book and did study the head, but well, I, I got, a, I got a little head of the game here. Boy. So I'm like, all right, loop. No, I probably don't want to try that. So aileron roll, wing overs. So I had them on my kneeboard card. All the aileron roll, ten degrees nose up, stop pitch roll. So my first time solo ever in an airplane, I was doing aerobatics for the first time. That is ever. outstanding. <laughs> nice. You know, it's it's one of the look, you know, stupid stuff. You look back. And, and then my second aerobatic flight, my instru- my first one, the instructor said, hey, I like to carry an extra five or ten knots into a loop. Makes it nice and crisp. Well, again, forward thinking, if, well, five or ten extra is good, 20 ought to be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I roll into this thing, and I just snap the snick right back into my lap. And we go vertical, and all my vision closes in. And I can hear the airplane, but it's way far away. Right, and I'm trying to pull back on the stick, and I can't move my arm. And then I feel myself float up into the straps, and I'm thinking, "Well, this probably shouldn't be happening on a loop." <laughs> and then I come to, and we're pointing straight down, and I pull out, and I'm flying, and it's quiet. And finally, the instructor in the back goes, "What the hell was that?" And I said, "A loop." Mistakes were made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I honestly couldn't tell because I was pretty much asleep for the whole thing but did, I, did he did he ask hey man did you got a gray out there a minute or <laughs> he he finally did because he says he said what happened at the top i said what well, I, I got a little loose at the top he said yeah and he said you're out 
Oh, no, sir. Yeah, you're out. No, sir. <laughs> he said, well, I I saw your head flopping around up front, so I'm pretty sure you were out. He said, because I was out. I, I put us, we were both sleeping going going vertical on a T-34. Oh, shit. And, and he came to about a half second before I did. <laughs> It was the rapid onset of G, man. Yeah. Hey, when you aren't ready, ready for it, it you doesn't take much. Yeah, I yeah. got it. I got a little excited. That's awesome. You know, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody G locking in a in a T thirty four. So thank you for that. Yeah, actually, awesome. that I got. I thought I told it on here. That's the only time I ever G locked was in a T thirty four. Yeah, the instructor brought it into the break and slapped on four Gs. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up going, you got it, you got it, you got it. And he goes, yeah, I got it. I'm in the back seat. I think it was an instrument hop or something like that. So, he, you know, it was his break and landing. And I'm, and I'm waking up going, what the hell? Up? And I'll tell you what, it, it took a good 20, 30 minutes to re-gauge my gyros after that. That was not something, that, you know, I was awake and conscious and able to function, but I wasn't right, not for a while. So, Don't ask me to do math. Yeah, right. <laughs> repeat were you were you with me there i think there were six of us that went up and did centrifuge training yes okay yeah. so there's only a couple of us that didn't pass out that day i didn't are you the other guy i didn't pass out but they kept getting mad at me because i i could feel it coming on and i you, yeah. you know you had the pickle button to go that's it i'm done that's as high as i could go and i could only get to about nine g's and then and I, I, whatever it was whether it was lack of hydration or whatever that day i was not able to go, you know, up to 10 or 11 G's, whatever the hell they were putting on us. But, but yeah, but they were like, you know, we can't, we can't piss and moan at you because you had enough awareness to bail out, you know, relax, relax the stick as it were before you sent yourself into a, into a blackout. But it, when I'd lose my vision, I'd go, yeah, okay. I, I can't see anything. It's, this is stupid. All right, Slogo, I have to plead I ignorance here. When you leave T-34s and you know you're going, you know, E-2s, what's the next step? T-2s. They, they've okay, changed well, it around a lot. It, 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 sometimes you go to – we went to the T-2s at VT-4. And that's and at they, mean side Pensacola, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think okay. it's an NFO squadron now if it's even still around. We, we go through everything, but like the firing, shooting guns, drop bombs. We do a little bit more instrument stuff, and then we CQ, and then we went to Corpus for the King Air T forty four, just an abbreviated syllabus. Okay, we went out and did you know you, you take a bunch of guys that have just flown the hell out of T twos for six months and carry your qual. Now you put them in a T forty four and send them out solo. More stupidities is going to happen. So we got our astronaut quals, my buddy and I on a solo. We're taking pictures, getting our astronaut quals. Okay, I, I know what you're talking about, but would you would you expand on that for our non-aviation, well, non-aviator? Well, it was, my, it was my buddy's idea because he showed up so hungover. He said, tell you, I'll do all the paperwork if you fly. So, all right. So we're flying solo and he unstraps. We're going up to... I think Kelly in San Antonio to do some bounces. It's a Saturday morning. And he got straps. And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm, I'm going to get my astronaut call. Give me zero G. I said, oh, okay. So we're fly on the airway, you yeah. know, trying to, trying to get a couple <laughs> hundred feet up. Oh, on the God. airway. <laughs> get a couple hundred feet up and then, you know, give a little push over. And, and I'm looking back at Mike the whole time. I'm doing it just laughing because he's back there, you know, <laughs> floating around in space. And I said, okay, I got to get my – oh, and we had uh, the glasses with the fake nose and mustache. You had to put those on. Nice. I don't know why. <laughs> we just we just did. Well, that made it that much better, Slug. Okay. Oh, yeah. The, the, the pictures are great. I got to find – they're somewhere around here. But So I said, okay, I got to get my astronaut call. So I, I give the controls over to my hungover buddy, and he's, he's not quite as gentle – with, so he pins me against the ceiling. Oh no! Realize we're blowing through. Stupid. <laughs> Correct. And then realize, oh crap, we're 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 blowing through our altitude. And then pulls the yoke into his lap and slaps me down on the on the oh, seat shit. and the floor. So uh, that was my astronaut call. 
<laughs> oh, that's funny. Good thing you didn't end up with a chipped tooth. Yeah. Or another <laughs> broken fib. Right. Holy cow. And okay, so what what's happening to the non aviators? If if you put a little bit of up momentum on the airplane and then you unload by pushing forward, you're actually causing the airplane to go down faster than gravity will pull the human body down. So relative to everything in the airplane, you're floating around like in zero gravity. And it's fun. But doing it on the airway is only slightly illegal. <laughs> ah. Ah. It's good training. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. What's going? We didn't have our wings yet. What, what can they do to us? Ray, what are they going to do? Pull your wings? <laughs> Sorry, can't help they've you. Already, they've already invested all that money. I think we're good. Yeah. So, very cool. So, T2s, then on to... You had to go to Corpus the then to fly the... Uh, the is it, was it the Queen Air or the Duchess? What are they? The T-44s, uh, right? T-44 King Air, King yeah. Air. Yeah, okay. Yeah. King Air 90, right? I don't know. So that's a multi-engine. Right, so where, where do you go the RAG? East Coast RAG. Of course, it's all East Coast now. VW 120 went through the RAG. You know, the, the going through the RAG, I mean, you, you know how it is. You come out of T-34s, you can fly that thing as, as well as your instructors. And the T-2, T-45s, like your students are coming out of there, you can fly the heck out of it. The E-2 is... It's a it's a little bit different monster. It's it's a it's a handful of an airplane. It's a big it's airplane, yeah. Fly. There's a whole lot of airplane, and I imagine the asymmetric hey, thrust on that thing. Was that Oceania? Kick your ass. No, it was Norfolk. I think it's an Oceania now. Okay, okay. you were in Nor- that was in Norfolk. So, and just to remind yeah. folks, so you get your wings, and then you go to the RAG, the replacement air group, which is where you learn how to fly your fleet airplane. So, so you got the E two. It's it. Let me ask this, I guess. How how are the controls on that? You said it's a whole, uh, you know, a handful of airplane, but it was all obviously hydraulically boosted and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, it was, or was like it? pretty heavy. It was a pretty heavy control field. Yeah, it was all hydraulics. Oh, okay. Uh, it was a Grumman bird. Oof, so, love them. So nothing but hydraulics. No no mechanical backup, which which that was one of our, our, our interesting flights in BAW 122. Oh, yeah, we're miles. going to talk about that here in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But the E2, you really have to make small corrections with the throttles because the props don't counter-rotate. And so every time you breathe on the throttles, you're dancing on the rudder pedals. That's why it's got, if you look at the tail okay. of the E2, it's got four vertical stabs. Three of them are rudders. And so you come up with the jets where you're, you know, you're jockeying the throttles around no problem. To the E2, where if you start doing that, I mean, you, you're going to be sideways, up and down, and and so it really teaches you to be to be smooth. No kidding! Oh. Wow. All right. And they didn't counter rotate the props. Okay. Well, That's... why keep a spare left motor and a spare right motor on the boat where you can just have a spare motor? Right. So. Well, fair enough. <laughs> so, for non aviators, when you have wing engines and you counter rotate the props you get rid of the problem called a critical engine it has to do with torque and p factor and all that stuff but oh man so yeah if you counter rotate the props that goes away it when when you lose an engine on either side with counter rotating props it's it's bad but it ain't as bad as losing the right engine i believe and, and our rag yeah. experience was you know typical or no losing the left engine right if you lose the left Would engine you- it's worse I don't know. You're oh, starting to scare. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> that shows me the last that. time I flew a, a multi-engine prop. <laughs> it's been a week or two. All right. Yeah, show my ignorance there. See, that's the beauty well, of a jet. The, you know, it's the it's the it's the most outboard engine on the right side is the is the worst one to to lose to lose. Yeah. Okay. If if they're all if all the props are that's right. The same. Yep. Yep. Yeah, because that's how it was in C one thirty. See, there you okay. go. So someone that has some, some multi-engine turbo prop time, the two of you. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, the Allison brothers. Yeah. Now, did you ever fly the C2, or was it just the E2? When I was a rag instructor, I got a little bit of C2 time. Okay. So they weren't there weren't like multiple airplanes in the same squadron. It was either E2 or C2. Yeah, except for the rag. Yeah. Where we okay. instructed on. All right. So, and the C2, for the listeners, is basically it's the E2 without the radar dish out, mounted on the back. Is that correct? It, it's cockpit's different. Okay. It, it's, it flies similar, but 
but it's it's quite a bit different, different fuselage. But now I, I think the C2s are gone. I think they've been replaced by the uh, Osprey. So I don't even think the C2 exists anymore. That's terrifying. <laughs> it is terrifying. Yeah. So tell us about the rag. How much fun was that? Did you have a good time there? Or? I had a great time. We, <laughs> okay. we showed up. Desert Storm 1 kicked off. And they took all of our parts. They took all of our airplanes. So we didn't have anything to fly. So I got, got really good at my jet ski that summer. And then in typical Navy fashion, we started getting our planes and our parts back. And they said, well, you guys are supposed to be finished in October. So you're going to be finished in October. Oh. So we were getting triple pumped. So you would we we do T flight in the morning, which is like a fam flight, right? You know, just learning okay. to fly the airplane. In the afternoon, we do a sim. We do an instrument sim, and then we grab dinner, take a nap, and then we come brief and go fly FCLPs in the middle of the night because the E two is a little quieter out there at Fentress Airfield, so they give us all the lovely middle of the night bounce periods. So we bounce out Fentress. We I live with two other guys. They're going through the rag with me. So we drive home and take a nap. Literally just kick your boots off and lay on top of your bed in your flight suit. 45 minutes, the alarm would go off. We'd wake up and drive in and start it all over again. So it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Holy smokes. I mean, I imagine you were Sounds good really by the end of that, but that is just, really cranking it. Just, Tired by the end of it. Yeah. What was the uh, what was the uh, footprint from start to finish? I mean, as far as time timeline, because that sounds really compressed. Oh gosh, I think it was after summer, probably late summer, early fall, and we finished up. I'd have to look when we CQ October, November, maybe. Wow. Yeah. That is. It was pretty brutal. Yeah. Satellite. And uh, let me back up just a little bit. You you went to the boat in T twos. That's the reason they put you guys in T twos, right? So you, your first boat experience, okay, was in the, the two seat jet T two. Landed on the Lexington out in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. That that was a great day. We we took off. I mean, it was still dark when we took off in in four ships, and you know, of course, the. Day or so before they showed us the video that the poor guy that had just got that adverse yaw departure on the go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So they, yeah, I was I was in Meridian when that happened. Yeah, they showed us that video about fifty times. You know, we're all thinking, Do you not we're think we're taking this thing seriously? Like we're we're pretty motivated. Yeah. We don't need this. Yeah. So we get out July and it's we're out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's hot, humid, the Lexington can only go so fast. So we we're circling over the boat, dash four in my four ship, and we dropped, we dumped our tank, tip tanks, but we still needed to burn down to whatever. They give us the call, you know, 99, you have to burn down to whatever weight. You know, so again, forward thinking, I think it was 21 at the time. I'm thinking, well, you know, in all engineering, there's a little slop. There's always a little slop. Yeah. So I'm thinking, if I get ballpark, I'm good. So whatever the weight was, I weigh, I get about three three to 500 pounds above it. I think, well, that's good enough. So I called out whatever fuel state they needed, and they said, Charlie. So I peel off from the force ship, and, and alone and unafraid, I, I come into the break. And and then I got the whole boat to myself. So, of course, you know, I'm thinking, well, I can't, I can't be taking it too far upwind. You know, I, I got to represent – so I break just past the bow. Now I'm assholes, and that was my first oh. time. With, you know, it's like you dumbass. Oh. <laughs> Your first time at the boat. First time at the boat. Got to represent, though, oh. baby. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That brings up the na- saying in naval aviation: "It's better to look good and die than live and look stupid." Right. So. That's right. <laughs> well, then as I roll into the groove, it occurs to me: Well, I have to do math now because I lied about my fuel state. So now every time I roll and make my ball call. Yeah, you got to give the right fuel. I've got to do public math. I got to know you're overweight. <laughs> I got to subtract. I got to subtract from my fuel state. Oh shit! Beautiful. Well, how'd it go? You get aboard? Went great. I, I had the Lexington to myself for two touch and goes and probably two or three traps. 
Nice. I trap, taxi up to the cat, punch off, trap, you know, repeat. Yeah, you know, and I remember my, my instructors, I said, well, how do you know if you got to get a good cat shot? They said, no, you'll know. I said, no, yeah, but, but come on. They're like, oh, you'll know. And I remember my first cat shot halfway down the cat stroke thinking, I'm going entirely too fast. Like I should not be going this fast right now, but it was it was great. I loved it. Yeah. We we had I went through T twos or four of us went through together. We did everything together, CQ together. Good group of guys, and so we we CQ cut the roof off of one of the guys' cars to celebrate, painted it all up for our CQ party. Oh boy! And so at at, at the we went out. And Pensacola. We all ended up in the fountain there, downtown Pensacola. And my one buddy says, man, it'd be cool if we could do this every day. And I said, well, yeah, that's what we're going to do every day. He's like, oh, yeah, that's right. (laughs) And then it's not going to be as cool, but, you know, that's going to start to suck after a while. But, oh, man. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you remembered your first cat shot. I, I remember coming off the boat first time and first of all i was screaming like a six-year-old girl because it forced the air out of my lungs and i'm like (laughs) and then i had to look down and see if my engines quit because it was relatively speaking so much quieter after i left the front of the boat like oh yeah okay they're still running (laughs) i was i was not prepared for that how fast that happened yeah it's hard to wrap your brain around it yep yep yeah. Well, so my, my first cat stroke experience was off the Kennedy. And then when I went back in A4s, it was on the Lex, which was a shorter stroke. So it was like, yeah. holy yeah. shit. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. a serious boot in the ass. Yeah, it is. Lex. Yes. And then did, did I talk about the T-shirts from the class behind us that went off the Kennedy? I think I did when we were talking to Obi. I don't know. Just yeah. You know, so we had class T-shirts for everybody, and you know, we had everyone that was there in the LSO and all that. Well, the class behind us went off the Kennedy because the Lex wasn't available, and they put on their T-shirt, which you couldn't have today. I guarantee. It was the picture of Marilyn Monroe with her dress blowing up over the grate, and it it had on the front of the shirt, "I bounced on JFK." <laughs> <laughs> Huh. I don't think I've ever heard that one before. That's good. That that's, was a great class T-shirt. That's genius. Yeah, yeah. it is genius. Yeah. So, you should have bottled that, right? Sold that for crying out loud! I'd, no, you I'd couldn't. Love to get my hands on one of those T-shirts today. But the problem is, I I wasn't in that class. Damn it! Oh well. Yeah. One of the cool squadron shirts I saw was I think it was one of the Hornet squadrons. This is a cartoon. Uh, you know, pilot with all his gear on just says, is it cool in here or is it just me? Uh, <laughs> right on. Oh, yeah. That's great. I wish I had that shirt. Then there were all the Bart Simpson patches that, after tail hook. I didn't do it. Didn't Nobody do saw it. me. You can't prove a thing. Yeah. <laughs> they were outlawed. Yeah. I wasn't there. Was I wasn't yeah. there. Nobody saw me. You can't prove a thing. <laughs> can't wear those. We, we had the outlawed patch in the Bear Aces with the cartoon... And you saw a Top Gun, I forget, I think it was one of the Rio's helmet, had the Bear Ace patch on it with the cartoon butt of a girl, Betty. Okay. And, and that was outlawed. So I sewed mine onto my flight jacket, so if anybody asked me to take it off, I'd... Well, Can't help you. Oops. I guess it's, Sorry. I guess it's stuck. So. Don't come off. Love to help you. Oh, man. All right. So when did you... You got to you got to the fleet. What time frame was that? And any anything memorable in your first fleet? Because you were uh, you were much like chemo, a brand spanking new as a uh, Wait, as an ensign. Twenty. So were you what was that? Ninety. Ninety uh, one. Got winged in ninety. Went through the rag in ninety one. Got to the bear aces in November December of ninety one. Um, Did you get Desi November? Yeah, was that? Did you get any combat? Did did you did, did you go on a float? Quickly? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did Bosnia. We did the no fly in Bosnia. Then we ran okay. down and did Southern Watch when they bombed the uh, Rocky Intelligence headquarters. We went down there for a while, okay. uh, and then back up into the Adriatic, flying over Bosnia. Which uh, which boat were you on most of that time? 
TR, Kage on the Roosevelt TR. Okay. And the Bear Aces were, that was just a great squadron when I got there. It was a stacked squadron. They just got back from the war. The planes were spotless. Great maintenance department. All the guys in there had a ton of experience. You know, so I show up. My first flight in the squadron, I go down to Key West with a guy. I think he was a safety officer. Good dude. Very by the books. Very by the numbers. Very by the books. I didn't know. Just met him. So we, he flies down. I fly back. So we're coming out of Key West. I'm thinking, well, I got I to gotta show this guy what a great stick I am. So I suck the gear up and do a low transition about 10 feet out of Key West with the most conservative pilot in the, in the goddamn squadron <laughs> who then loses his shit. You know, so I thought once again, great, great first impression. And then, but that squadron was, it was a, the skipper was a pilot who medical, he lost his medical right after the war with a complicated he had cancer. Oof. I guess they went, they, they got it, but then they went back through and found something. I don't know. But he, he really wanted aggressive pilots. And our, our senior flying pilot was a TPS grad who he got put in hack. He did a flyby of the TR during Desert Storm where you couldn't see the airplane. The top of the dome was below the flight deck. So they put him in hack and then realized we don't have enough pilots, so they had to take him back out of the hack. So that was, that was the, this how the squadron was set up like we we fly aggressive we would go out do bounces where you'd land on one main mount keep it on center line hop over the other main mount you go back and forth a couple times then suck the gear up five feet and then pop it up low transition we do low levels i flew by half dome in yosemite one time that was very uh, very scenic near flight violation we <laughs> national park we're doing a great low level i'm an east coast guy so we're doing this low level and I had all the strip charts, and then we just went off script and started, hey, look at that cabin. And next thing I go, oh, that's pretty cool. And, and the guy with me is like, holy shit, that's half dome. I'm like, okay. It's like, no, we're in Yosemite. Well, is that bad? Yeah. <laughs> is it bad? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, first cruise, we, uh, I got to meet the uh, – New President Clinton, he came out to visit us. We were doing CQ before we steamed east for deployment. Okay. So he flies out, and the night before, the skipper of the boat, I mean, it was probably a 45-minute announcement over the 1MC, you know, just kind of like, hey, guys, you know, everybody's got their own political view. Basically, it's like, please don't get me shit-canned. <laughs> don't say something stupid that's going to get me shit-canned. It took him 45 minutes to get the point across. So the next day, I'm in the ready room, and, and uh, the skipper, who he and I weren't great fans of one another, he, he walks by, and he's like, hey, is that flight suit clean? And I said, ish. He's like, be on Vulture's Row at noon. <laughs> okay. Well, they thought Clinton and his entourage, they're going to go watch flight ops. Well, they're going to go to the bridge. This is March, and we're out in the Atlantic. This is colder than shit. So, yeah, yeah. But let's just take a J.O. Pogue from every squadron and park his ass out on Vulture's Row to freeze just as a backup. Well, he ended up coming out on to Vulture's Row where we were, and we were cold and pissed by the time he came out. So we had one of the White House staffer came out first and tells us we can't be there. So oh, you guys have to leave. Yeah, oh, really? it's our boat. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, no military can be out here when the president comes out. And, oh. and I think I got whoa about all i got out in this rio from vf84 he flew past me and he was like a like a pit bull on this guy just in his face and poking him and screaming and the guy's kind of running backwards and in, in the island he went and, and we're high-fiving and laughing and then secret service guys come out i mean right out of central casting they got the shades and the earpieces and the trench coats and they're walking around looking and, and fine i look at the one secret service guy i go I go, dude, what the hell are you looking for? He just kind of looks at me and goes, we're on a nuclear aircraft carrier in the middle of the goddamn ocean. Like, who do you think is going to be out here besides us? And he just kind of looked and walked in, and then the, the whole entourage came out. 
And so it was it was an A6 Bubba, and then me and then everybody out just happened to where we're standing. Everybody came out, so it was Cargrew and some other admirals, and and uh, Clinton Aspen was sec def at the time. Yep. Yeah. So I see this admiral look at A6 Bubba next to me. And he looks at his jacket, call, his call sign was Calvin. He goes, Calvin, have you met the Secretary of Defense? No, sir. He goes, well, introduce yourself. And he pushes him, like puts his hand on his back and shoves him over by Aspen. And I was like, well, that was interesting. And I'm listening to the conversation. I mean, it's noisy. You know, we're doing flight ops. But I just I just hear SecDef going, well, what's that? What's that? And, what? and I'm thinking, well, for Christ's sake, dude, you're the Secretary of Defense. Do you know what this shit is? Like, of course not. Do you don't get a, a at least a coloring book like right. Here's a right. brief. Here's all the crap you're going to see. <laughs> yeah. So so then at, it occurs to me like, well, shit, I'm next in line. Is it is it the thought enters my my brain? Admiral turns out looks at me and looks at my jacket. Sluggo, have you met the president? No, sir. Well, introduce yourself. And he shoves me <laughs> shoves me up. <laughs> <laughs> in front of Clinton, and so I, you know, so this is ninety three. I'm twenty four. Yeah, and so I, I shook his hand, and he gave me the, the dead fish, yeah, kind of this. Yeah, afraid of that. Jeez. And it, uh, it's, well, when you got to shake a million hands, I guess it's hard to do it firm, but. Well, Whatever. Been, you know, Are you shitting me? Come on. He'd been in office 15 minutes by the time he came. Yeah. So, but it like, it stops you when somebody can like, what the? Yeah. Because he's not yeah. a small e- dude. E- right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm handshake. Look him in the eye. It ain't hard. Correct. So I, I had 20 minutes. I just had to like, well, I started running out of shit to talk about. Like, well, that's non-skid. So you don't slip i like dude i <laughs> ask a question i don't know what else to tell you like ask something never ask a question never never nothing never said thanks just turned on his heel and and just walked away so it was a wow. that's interesting because you know the, the thing i've always heard about guys who make it to that level is that when they engage with somebody they make you feel like you're the most important very person charming, around yeah very, yeah, yeah exactly that's that's one of the few times I've ever heard that. Maybe it's you, Sluggo. Yeah, Maybe, uh, you know. Have you talked yeah. to my wife? <laughs> <laughs> right on. The top of my head made it into Newsweek. A friend of mine sent me a page out of Newsweek with a Sharpie. And so it was like, is, with an arrow, like, is this your head? Like, yeah. <laughs> but I got a picture. Actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's behind me here. A buddy of mine went to the Pentagon, a squadron mate, and there's a picture of. Clinton and me hanging in the Pentagon. Huh? And, Shit. Yeah, so it's it's just one behind my head here. And so he tells my everybody knew my folk, my mom, my stepdad. They lived in Northern Virginia. So we used to go to DC all the time. So he he tells my folks, all oh, there's this picture, Sluggo, Clinton hanging. You know, so my, my mom, of course, has to get it. My buddy's no help whatsoever. So she made some phone calls and and got got this picture signed. I don't know. I look at it. I don't see where you can tell a pen has been to paper or a stamp has been to paper. It looks like a stamp to me. But when I was a single guy, though, it was proudly displayed at my house in Virginia Beach because you know I had to swing a new date by the house. I'd always walk her by that picture. You know. Oh, yeah. is that the president? Oh, that. Yeah, yeah, that's the president. <laughs> we're we're good buds. We're like this. I got to I got to update a couple things here Sluggo. I think we've already covered this repeat but hack. Oh yeah. You mentioned you mentioned your XO or Alpso or somebody was in hack for flying below the deck. Can you That's define right. hack for our non-naval aviator listeners? He was in trouble. He uh he was a he was a bad dog. He peed on the rug and you got to go sit in timeout. They take you off the flight schedule and Make you think about what you did for a couple of days. <laughs> no flight weeks, time for you. Long. Yeah. <laughs> Which in some and, situations, it's, it's, it's kind of a gift. Right. Oh, you know, I don't have to fly for a week? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. How about this? Vulture's Row. Oh, yeah. Vulture's Row is the, the I guess you could call it like a, like a balcony on the side of the island, the superstructure, the carrier. It's a great place to watch flight ops. 
you know, being retired, I'd love to go out. You know, back then you just take it for granted. Now I'd love to go right. out and stand out there and watch flight off because it's all right in front of you. I mean, you got a front row for the whole, the whole ballet that's going on out there, which is a, it's a, it's a thing to see. It, it is really a ballet. Is. It's an amazing thing to see. And here's the other yeah. thing, and and I think probably less uncommon now. How many pictures do you have? Right? I mean. It, the time frame we were in, nobody had iPhones, nobody had cameras yeah. in their pocket. So getting pictures of that stuff was pretty rare. And I think it's probably more common today. But like you said, you take it for granted. Don't take for granted that you're going to get, be able to run around with M16s and grenade launchers and sea yeah. flight deck operations and all those sorts of things. So if you're on active duty, take pictures of that stuff. You're going to want it after you retire. I can assure you, because a lot of that stuff I don't have photos of, and I would love to be able to to go back and look at some of that stuff. Gone. Oh, we had, we had a guy, the camera would materialize. When somebody would get naked or do something stupid, this guy's camera would come out of nowhere. So we, had, we were in Rhodes, Greece, and we got some, you know, you, you'd get as far away from the Navy as possible. So we're, we rented a condo on the water, and the sun's coming up, and one of our NFOs gets naked and goes running down the beach, fists in the air, and of course, camera comes out, buddy snaps a picture. So fast forward, we get back from cruise. This guy married into a very big money family. And the rehearsal dinner is at the country club. Oh, My no. buddy has eight by 10 glossies in a manila folder. And he's just walking. And we had already shown our ass to, like, to the fam because they're telling stories. And so... She's going on, she's a doctor now, so her sorority sisters are telling the tee-hee-hee stories, and then we tell a story about, you know, remember the time you you pissed on the skipper's leg, and, and they got worse from there, so the body's like, oh, story time's over, so now we're just mingling, and so my buddy's walking around this folder of naked pictures of this dude, and he's just oh, handing them out, and he goes up to his grandmother, and hi, would you like a picture of... But Bill, oh, thanks. He'd hand it to her, and then he'd be off to the next person by the time they'd see. <laughs> so in the wedding rolled around the next day, like, we were, her mom was pissed. Person so A, we, what's, what's the uh, plural of person? <laughs> person A, non grata? <laughs> non grata, yep. Persona. Oh, wow. that's outstanding. <laughs> yeah, all right. Same, same guy, he was a rag instructor with me. He comes back from a flight with a student just laughing his ass off. And, and I say, you remember that, you know, because the Naval Academy ROTC, yeah, for the non-flying people out there, they send their midshipmen out during the summer, like one summer. Oh, right. They're, they're, spending they're first class the crews. They're second class crews. You gotta, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a, we had a MIDI on, in the Bear Aces with us in 93. So, and you forget, as soon as they leave, you forget all about them. So my buddy's flying this student. He says, so we're, we're back to when we're on the boat, this, this MIDI, he goes flying and he says, oh, hey, sir, can you keep an eye on my camera for me? I'm, I'm going flying. Oh, no. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> so my buddy goes, uh, yeah, sure. I'll, Got your I'll back. I'll keep an eye on your camera for you. Yeah. So as soon as he leaves the ready room, of course, Two guys are in the back of the ready room, flight suits down, hairy ass pictures. <laughs> so fast forward, my buddy's flying with his student. He says, what fleet squad were you in, sir? He's like, I was 124. I did my midshipman cruise with 124. 93? Yeah. It's like, huh. I don't remember. He goes, yeah. I went flying one day and I left my camera with the SDO. My buddy's like, this is sounding familiar. <laughs> well, this is back in the days of film. So right. he goes home, gives his film. His mom takes the film to like Walgreens, <laughs> right? And uh, half the pictures are these two dudes <laughs> naked, hairy asses. So she says, <laughs> "He's like, so my mom is like, do we need to? We need to have a talk." <laughs> <laughs> uh, is you're not. Is there something you're not comfortable telling us, son? Uh, oh, geez, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> That's a show title there. Do we need to have a talk? <laughs> it's, a, it's a small oh, world. Love it. Oh, man. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, we, you started off. You, you opened us up with a, 
a, a, a tease on a story. So I'd like yeah. to come back to that briefly. And then we also chatted ever so briefly about a hydraulic failure, which I believe occurred at night. So oh, yeah. I'd like to do that. So let's acknowledge our sponsor. Thank you for uh, helping make this show possible for everybody. And we'll be back to uh, talk about those hair raising stories. No matter which holiday you celebrate, the gift giving season is upon us. Won't you consider getting a personal gift for one of the most important people in the world this year? Yourself. That's right. You deserve to do something for yourself you know you've always wanted to do. Give yourself the gift of being able to communicate with people in another language. This winter, step beyond linguistic borders with Babbel. In just three weeks, you could be speaking a new language, reshaping your brain's abilities beyond just language processing. That's the sound of getting it right in Babbel. Sounds are universal, and understanding them is a crucial step in learning a new language. With Babbel, you're not just hearing words, you're immersing in them. You hear native speakers tuning your ear to what words should sound like, breaking down barriers to understanding foreign languages. Why Babbel? Because it works. No need for expensive tutors or apps that are more game than education. Babbel's 10-minute lessons, crafted by over 150 language experts, are designed for real-world effectiveness and rapid learning. You deserve it. Vous le méritez. Babbel is for real conversations created by real people. Its tools and tips are grounded in everyday life, making learning both accessible and practical. Babbel isn't just about learning a language. It's about mastering real-world conversations, understanding culture, and enhancing your cognitive abilities. With Babbel's variety of lessons, live classes, and advanced speech recognition, you're set for success. So why wait? Start your language journey with Babbel today and speak a new language this winter. And now a limited time offer for our listeners. Get 55% off your Babbel subscription at babbel.com slash so there I was. That's 55% off at B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash so there I was. But hurry, rules and restrictions apply. Babbel.com slash so there I was. So let's get back to chatting about the dangers of carrier flying. We're, I, I'm assuming you were doing carrier aviation the day that uh, you had the hydraulic issue. No, I was no. Uh, okay. All right. on a counter drug flight Oh, in the steel jaw. So I did, I did two years in the bare aces, and the steel jaws were on the forestall. So the forestall went away, the air wind went away, but they kept the steel jaws around to do counter drug. That was getting to be a, a huge drain on the E2 community doing all these counter drug deployments. So, but all their carrier experience guys were rolling out and they were still getting guys coming from the rag that needed to CQ. So I went over there as kind of their carrier subject matter expert. So it was a semi instructor tour, I guess you would say. So we did a lot of, I mean, counter drug was our bread and butter. So we were flying out of Puerto Rico, out of Rosie roads at night, We were quite a ways out over the Caribbean, and we had two NFOs in the back. One of the guys went on to be a squadron skipper, and he says, hey, he goes, do you hear that? Hear what? It sounds like a helicopter. What? He's like, yeah, it sounds (laughs) like a helicopter. They're not that fast. Because they're in the back of the airplane in between us and them is the equipment compartment with all the racks of boxes and electronics and stuff. So they're, they're maybe... 15 feet behind us and then behind the door to keep it dark back there to see the radar and stuff. So I send my co-pilot back. I said, go back and, and see what's going on. Cause everything looked normal up front. He comes back up. He said, yeah, it sounds like it's a helicopter back there. That's I said, good. I said, listen, we're heading back. I don't know what's going on, but you know, so as soon as I started turning, they start yelling over the ICS, like turn the dome off. Holy shit. And, like what the hell is going on? They're like, it sounds like the the dome's coming apart. Oh yeah. And they okay. said, are, are your how do your hydraulics look? And you would always, as a student, they would always fail your left combined hydraulic pump. 
because you could see the flight pumps were above, as you looked across, they're above the pedestal. And the combined, you could see the right one, but the left one was hidden by the pedestal. So you'd always have to look up over to see it. Well, sure as shit. They said, how do your hydraulics look? And I said, I go, they look good. And I looked up over, and as I looked up over, the left went, good, dead. Oh, shit. Just went from good to nothing. And I said, ah, oh, shit, we just lost in the combined hydraulic system. That powered everything. Your flight controls, nose wheel steering, brakes, tail hook, all that. And then you had a backup flight system that just was your flight controls. And so we started heading back. And then the right combined pump drops to zero. So I told one of the back guys, I said, go up and, and mark the slugs. So you have your hydraulic reservoirs in the equipment compartment. Right. Combined is empty. And keep in mind, we never got a hydraulic low light. That should be your first indication is a hydraulic low light that you're losing fluid. Never got a light. So I said, go up, mark the slug on the flight reservoir. And then you hack your clock. You give it five minutes, have them go back up and check. So just as a backup, because they're two completely separate systems. He goes up, comes back here and plug back in the intercom. And he goes, dude, we're losing the flight. Oh, like, holy shit. So that's when I, okay. I firewall. Yeah. So in plain English, what does that mean, please? That means if you lose, now if we lose our hydraulic, system our, our flight hydraulic system we have no flight controls the plane becomes unflyable yeah. and there's early test video of an f-14 where that happened and it just rolls it's un yeah. yeah it's like flight a paper airplane. freeze <laughs> they freeze yeah. where they are you can't yeah. move them in and it is what it is and we don't have ejection it. seats it's a it's an ordeal to get all five guys out of the e2 it's yeah. been done but it's it's an order, and, so, and if you're rolling, you're there's no way you're going to get out. Yeah. So you do have pa parachutes. Yeah, they have parachutes. No kidding. Uh, All right. If you if you can get out the door. Yeah. It's good luck done. if you're rolling. Yeah. And ironically enough, the steel jobs back when they were on the forest all had a, the only five man bailout. No kidding. And two of those two of those guys came to our squad in 124 afterwards. But, uh, okay, I'm so so. I'm sorry, I'm interrupted. You said uh, so. If we lose flight, you know, we're losing flight, is what he said, and you went. We're, we're losing rut, rut. the flight. So I put the throttles up into the the takeoff range, the five minute limit range, and and just I'm burning up the engines. We're we're hauling ass as fast as I can pedal back to uh, Rosie Roads, and he's going up and checking it, and it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping, <sighs> and no. it's just quiet in the airplane. And we're, we're hauling ass and it's just silence and which, you know, is not good. I don't want guys. Right. When things strategy. go bad, people get quiet. So, so finally I said, I go, Hey, uh, anybody stressed? And so they, the aircraft or the, or the, the mission commander's like, yeah, God damn it. We're stressed. Jesus. Right. Of course. And I said, good. I said, look, let's start talking here. Like, what am I missing? Like, are we missing anything? What can we do? And then we finally started talking about, Okay, once we start down into into rosy roads, there's a bailout altitude. There's a minimum bailout altitude, so we really had to make the decision like a go no go. Yeah. So by the time we got to rosy roads, I think the slug was bottomed out. So that now you, you have no idea how much fluid is left. Sluggo, explain what the slug is, please. Also, I we it's a it's a piston. So you've got the 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 reservoir which is a big drum that holds hydraulic fluid right. with a spring-loaded piston that keeps and it's a, it's pressurized to 3000 psi and as you lose fluid that that piston obviously keeps going in mm -hmm. and and it tells you and, and on the slug i think there actually are lines that tell you the acceptable range where that slug should be to tell you, you have enough hydraulic fluid well it's Beyond that, it's just going in, going in, kind of like a syringe. If you can imagine right. a big yeah. syringe. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a good that's analogy. That's a great right? analogy, yeah. Well, that Excellent. syringe is bottomed out. So however much fluid is in that system, who knows? Mm. And so it, it bottomed out, and we had to come to an agreement. What are we going to do? Are we going to jump out of this thing over the water off the coast of Puerto Rico at night? Yeah. There are no assets airborne. Or, you know, so I said, I, I say, and I, I, I kept the gear up and I kept the speed up as long as I could. 
And so we decided let's let's push and came hauling ass in. You gotta blow the gear down. So that you know, had to give that a little while. So we got the gear down, took a took a trap, took a field arrestment. Luckily there's a C two squadron was there on debt and they had some LSOs who were getting ready to head out onto town and they got the phone call. They came and so we had someone there to, to wave us and we took the trap. Shut down because you can't do anything. You can't taxi. Right. You can't no brakes, no steering. And the the funny thing, which shows you how the mind of a twenty some year old dude. There was this extremely attractive Alyssa girl that worked in the hangar for. So we just you know our lives are flashing before our eyes. That boy is a pig. <laughs> <laughs> so we land. Now it's quiet. The plane shut down. Flashing lights all around us. They're trying to get us out. Who comes out driving the, the tow tractor but this super attractive gal? And so the guy's like, holy shit. Hey, oh, it's, it's that, it's that good-looking gal from the hang. So he yells to the back, to the two guys in the back, like, hey, it's the hot chick from... So they come flying up into the car. They're crammed in, looking out, you know, looking out. Up, and it just hit me, like, how quickly. It's like an Etch-A-Sketch. We went from like five minutes ago, holy shit, are we jumping out of this thing or what are we going to do to, oh, hey, check out the hot chick driving me. Driving, driving the tug. tug. <laughs> Beautiful. Shiny object. Yeah. Right. Uh, Squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> yep. oh. That's why the military likes 20-year-olds. Right. 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 Yeah. I was just sitting there thinking when we were talking about go, you guys would have been perfectly justified to go, yeah, hey, you know, U.S. Navy, your airplane's at the bottom of the ocean. Go get it. <laughs> Had, had we not been at night over water, nobody out there waiting for us, and the parachutes yeah. sucked. Uh, oh, we had heard tests on our, our these new parachutes; they weren't great. So all those kind of added up to let's let's push and, and get the thing on on the ground. Mm. That's amazing, absolutely amazing, and terrifying. Cause well, and, and, and we get out. That's the other. We get out of the airplane. The whole side of the yeah. airplane was just red with hydraulic fluid. So what happened was an aileron actuator basically just came apart. Oh, geez. So because the aileron actuators are fed, one tube comes from the combined system. Yeah. One tube comes from the flight system, and it had, had a catastrophic failure. So it pissed out all the combined, and then it was. Boy, it would have been nice to be able to that. isolate one side or the other, and you know. But I guess you can't tell where the leak is. So, Holy and then we found out why we didn't get the low level light. The switches were installed backwards in the reservoir. So oh. as that slug goes in, it triggers a switch. It gets to a certain point, triggers a switch to get your low light. But apparently, as one of the maintainers told me, if to test that, the proper way to test it is to drain the system and let the slug flip the switch. Because it looked the same forward or backwards. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what guys would do is to save time and just reach in, I guess, their finger or something and flip this. Oh, it's good. The light's coming on. And so both switches were installed backwards. Whoops. Yeah. Whoops. And that's indeed. Um, okay. We, we got I got a little bit a little admin. Let's yeah. back up for a second. The dome on the E2, it rotated, right? Mm -hmm. What powered that? Was that hydraulic as well? Yeah. Because that's the the noise what what got their attention was, and and the thumping we heard the helicopter sound were the hydraulic pumps cavitating. Okay. And the brass fittings inside of those hydraulic pumps, and they finally just disintegrated. Those chunks of brass went through the hydraulic lines and into the rotodome gearbox, and it was a lot oh. of grinding and gnashing of, of metal. Yeah, yeah, that's not good ever. Okay. So this was not a simple repair to that no, airplane. No. Oh, and I, I no. can't remember. I, I think we might have torched both the engines. I don't know if they had to replace them or if they had to inspect they them. They got their what. airplane back. Oh, well. well. Nice job getting it back, Nice sir. job indeed. This we, is not not related to that complex non-normal you just had, but it's I, I want to I get this out of the way before, before we run out of time. Sluggo. What? Where did that come from? Your call sign. It, it, can you? Can we talk about it, or is it no, some it, things that are less sad? I, 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 I'm sad to say it's it's not a very interesting story. It was a you know young guy with 
bit of a quick temper and you know they pull <laughs> they pull stuff on the new guy and I'm like, well, if you guys want to pull stuff on me, then I'm going to get you back even worse. And so it came from the Mr. Bill show, the sluggo that would light the dog on fire. And, yeah. Which, which and, Oh, no, Mr. Bill. Yeah. 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 Which so, may uh, have to do with, uh, we, we may, uh, I, I bet that uh, has something to do with a uh, given coffee mug. And we'll chat about it. Maybe close the show with that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. With, with that coffee mug, right? There, there you go. Yeah. There it is. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But... Let's go. I'd like to go and chit chat just a little bit about that Clara between the burble and the ramp, and you were Clara yeah, on the ball. How you started? How you started it? Yeah. How you started our uh, our episode? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think we're doing workups and daytime. That means you're getting ready to qual. You're you're doing yeah. your qualifications, getting everybody up to speed to do yeah. boat, so you can go on a de- deployment. So we're out in. The, I'm pretty sure we're out in the Atlantic. Okay. And. You know, rolling into the groove in a case two, so it's an instrument approach during the day. And at a mile, you know, you start looking out and you, you call the ball. So you let the LSOs know you can see the Fresnel lens, which gives you your glide path. And I couldn't see anything. And we had the wipers going. It was a gray splotch against a bigger gray splotch. <laughs> and I said, I said, Clara, to, to the guy in the right seat, he does the radio calls he does the ball call and i said i said claire i can't see shit he goes i can't either so he called claire and they said turn on your taxi light turn on your taxi light to paddles contact which means the yellow says we can see you so they said paddles contact keep it coming so i'm flying kind of seat of the pants i mean you can feel you know you're getting a little bit of a sink you know a little power you know so I, and i'm just i'm full on remote control now and, you know, they're giving me a little right for line up. I give it to them, a little power, I give it to them. And so, guy in the race, he calls Claire again, you know, kind of remind him, like, FYI, we still can't see shit. And they kept us coming. And, and I, I'm going through the burble. I can feel the plane coming through the burble. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm getting ready to come on the power. Like, okay, these guys are going to wave me off any second now, like any second. Because you can't, the scan was so poor in E2. It's not like I could look at my gyro. I'm looking out, trying to pick something up and looking through my, my in, AOA index, which is keeping us on speed. And the whole time I'm thinking, okay, Eddie, I should be waving off about, wham, next time we come to a stop, like, holy shit, <laughs> we just landed. <laughs> and I start laughing. You know, we taxi out of the wires. I was like, we shut down. I look over to the guy in the right seat. I'm like, well, that was something, and his hands were shaking. Yeah, but he was already. just he was just I was busy flying, yeah. and he was watching. But I'm yeah. and so now at this point I'm thinking, well, I got an okay underline coming my way, right on. Which is a you know in the in the grading world is an A plus 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 plus. Yeah, and there it's a unicorn. Yeah, you, I've never seen one given out, but I'm thinking you just this. recovered in this weather. Old Sluggo is getting himself an okay underline. So the LSOs come around to the ready room, you know, and I'm like that I'm like that kid at Christmas, you know. I, I know I know I'm getting what I asked Santa Claus for and and so he walks in and he's like, Whatever, whatever, little this, little that for okay three wire. I said What You forget you forget the underline there, champ? He goes, Were you on fire? I said, Well no, but I was clear the whole way down. He's like, well, yeah, we did all the work. Okay. Oh, for crying out loud. But do a little Before more work and put an underline under my okay. You little- so so just so <laughs> our listeners and I can have this hey, hang straight. Hang on. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm psychotic. I saw Fig writing down verbal. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, I did. But, but <laughs> what, I, before I, okay. before I, want, I get that, I want to say, okay. just so we're clear on this, you basically did a zero zero trap. Right. On an aircraft carrier. Right. Hand flown. Fuck. Hand, hand flown. Hand flown. <laughs> That's fucked up. Okay. <laughs> we we know what it is, but would you explain to our non carrier aviation listeners burble and what that means and where where you get it and that sort of thing? Well what what makes you know people think land on an aircraft carrier what makes it difficult is the size of the landing area, which is one of the factors, yes. What really makes it difficult is the air 
behind the carrier. So you got this big carrier going across the ocean at whatever speed, 20 knots, whatever they're, whatever they're steaming, and they point it into the wind. So you got the wind coming across the flight deck, hopefully as straight down the flight deck as they can get it, and the flight deck is 60 feet off the water. So that wind comes across that flight deck at 60 feet. On the back of the flight deck, it comes down off the round down. So that wind comes down, hits the water, and then curves up. And in between coming down and curving up, you've got this spinning, dirty, swirly, turbulent air, which we call the burble. So as you're coming around to the back of the boat, first thing you hit is we call it the rooster tail. So you get that lift with where the wind is coming up. And usually in the daytime, that's when you're rolling wings level. So you're rolling wings level, you're picking up vertical lift. At the same time, you hit the rooster tail where you're picking up more vertical lift. So you kind of want, the plane wants to go high fast. And then you hit the burble, which is this dirty, turbulent air. So now you're going to lose lift. And so you kind of have to power, and it's, and it's bumping the airplane around a little bit. And right before you cross the, cross the ramp, you hit that suck hole with that wind that's coming down that pulls you down into the ramp and then immediately you come into ground effect whereas with you're within a wingspan of the landing surface you get all this extra lift so you lose lift and then you gain lift right and that's what bolters a lot of guys if you have too much power through that suck hole and then you come into ground effect then you go floating across the wires so that's and then the whole time because you're landing on an angled flight deck and the carrier's going straight, your runway is moving to the right the whole time. So you're, right. you know, right for line up, right for line up. So the whole time you're 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 dealing with the rooster tail and the burble, and and you're also dealing with keeping it on lineup because E two, you had like three feet of wingtip clearance before you're clipping airplanes if they were parked on the foul line. So you really had to hawk that center line, and then. If the ocean was was rough, you also had the deck going up and down. So you add it's that just, little variable in there. It's just one shit show after another here all of a sudden. <laughs> oh. No, the Air Force guys are like, it's how could you miss? There's yeah. four wires. Yeah. Right? Don't even have to flare. <laughs> yeah. Those gringos. <laughs> how could it be easier than this? Yeah. Well, yep. There's four wires. Yeah, it's simple. <laughs> and then and as a rag instructor, you get because an E2. You know, you're making a million power corrections the whole way down, and it's right. so you're dancing on the rudders. So, as an instructor, in when you go through jets and CQ, you're solo. Yeah. Oh, you, so you're by yourself. You have to go with students as an instructor. Yeah. So yeah. we take oh, them their God. first time. Their first time seeing the boat at night is with us. That's just terrifying all by itself. Well, you, you I, I kind of got to the point where you're at night, you're, you're almost like a therapist <laughs> yoga instructor. Cause it's not like you're not, at least I wasn't breathe deep, especially after, after, after my first on wing, I was very cognizant of not, you know, being patient with guys. Yeah. And so that paid off at night with the guys. Cause some of the guys, they'd be strong during the day and they'd freak out at night. Some guys be okay during the day. And then at night, because maybe the fear or the stress, it would focus them and, and the light would come on bright for them. But I'd never concentrated so hard in my life as I did as an instructor with students at night. I mean, you really were almost plugged into their brain and trying to anticipate every little move. It was a terrifying thought. Made. Yeah. And but you really you, you know you wouldn't say like you'd be like hey a little power a little, little right for line up little okay you're good little, little. you know it was it was very that soothing sort of very yeah it was you know you almost want to light a candle <laughs> right you know, a little uh-huh. aromatherapy <laughs> right rub their shoulders <laughs> yeah instead of the power power <laughs> whoa whoa easy with the, what are you doing oh my my closest <laughs> near death experience was a beautiful blue sky. Calm, sea, lovely day. Right. What could go wrong at this point? With the, it's one of those students that he knew everything. You know, you, 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 oh, oh, I know. One, I know. Of, those, one yeah. of those, yeah. They're the dangerous ones. They're good, too. They know everything because they're pretty good. Yeah. And what happened with him, daytime, we're, we're coming through the 90, and he got a little bit of an overshoot. We roll wings level, get that rooster tail. So now we got a high overshooting start. So now we're high. 
we have too much power in the airplane and we're too far right. And I was about a half second behind him. And sure enough, he put in a big angle of bank, yanked the power to idle. Boy. We hit the burble and the plane just stopped flying. We just, we dropped. And that's the only time I've ever had that time compression where time slowed down. Yeah. And I firewalled the throttles. I took the airplane, grabbed them, firewalled. The LSOs are screaming. I mean, it went from power to wave off like that. Yeah. I roll wings level. I thought we hit the flight deck. I, I cringe as we crossed the ramp because I thought we were at least ripping the landing gear off. Like I still, it it looked like we were going to hit hit the ramp, and and we go over the ramp, and I kind of do this. We clear the round down, and then my next thought was, oh shit, I don't want to inflate, so I don't want that tail hook to catch a wire because I am so low. But right. I'm climbing out, and if I right. catch that wire, oh yeah, it's just going to stop me and slam us onto the flight deck. And so my brain was thinking fast enough because this isn't a standard procedure. But my brain went, "Hey, you should probably get that tail hook up." But my left hand, because I'm pushing, I want the nose up to to climb, at, but, yeah. at, to climb, or at least. But I don't want to crank it too much and get the ass end down. So I'm Plank kind of that hook. Yeah. playing it across the flying kind of flat across the flight deck. And our hook, you had to pull it out. You had to pull it back and up. And all my hand went was up. And I'm just yanking on the hook handle as I'm flying it across the deck. Bend that Luckily, damn thing up. <laughs> oh, my God. And so we're climbing out. And I'm, <sighs> so Gary who is one of my buddies went through T2s with, we lived together for like two years. He was the, the head LSO. You know, the LSOs are the guys that grade all the passes. So he just says side to side, which means student gets out of the left seat, moves to the right, instructor moves to the left seat. Cause you always had to land on the boat from the left seat. Right. Yeah. And he says side to side, which means he's a disqual. He's done. And this guy looks over me and goes, what? <laughs> what? And like, I what? Go, I'm like, what? He's like, I got a little low. I go, dude, we were looking into the jet shop. Like, we, that was more than a little low. And he's like, <laughs> and he's arguing, and I'm turning downwind because oh we don't want to stretch the pattern out. And I go, get out of the seat. Just do get out of the seat. And he's still arguing. I finally go, get the fuck out of the seat. <laughs> so he climbs out. I jump in. I'm strapping. I'm rolling off the 180. And I'm still trying to get strapped in. So I land. I'm kind of sitting there. They, they taxi us up. And Gary calls me up, and I go, I tell the student, I go, get the fuck out. I'm so pissed. <laughs> and he's like, ooh, and gets out. And Gary calls me up, and he goes, uh, he goes, you want to call today? You want to get back on the horse? I said, uh, send me another student. He goes, ah, the boy. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So later, we're in the red, and Gary, he is the nicest guy. And so we're in the red room. The LSOs all come in. They got the big powwow up front telling this guy that he's going home. He's going to roll to the next class. And he's arguing with him. His typical mode. And I can't hear what's going on. But it's funny seeing someone that's like Ned Flanders when they get angry. It's interesting <laughs> to see how the anger comes out of Ned. Yeah. So, and this guy, all I hear is like, what? What? And finally, Gary goes, listen, asshole, Sluggo is my friend, and you almost killed him. You will not kill my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the angriest I think I've ever, I've ever seen. Man, him. no kidding. Well, you almost died, dude. Yeah, that's... Nah. But it was... I, I remember going out, because I came from the Steel Jaws, where it's a semi-instructor, and I go to the rag, and I'm telling my buddy who's head LSO at the time, I said, I go, put me on the next boat, Dad. He's like, nah, man, you got to instruct for six months before you go to the boat with students. I'm like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. He's like, careful what you ask for. So my first time out instructing on the boat, first time with students at night, I couldn't get through to them. Like, telling them things, they're not listening. I'm like, man, I, I guess I'm not as good instructing as I thought I was. You know, I just couldn't crack the code with these students. So I'm up in the wardroom at Midrats, you know, having a 
having a, a soda at one o'clock in the morning, kind of licking my wounds. And uh, one of the other instructors walks in. It was his first instructor boat too. And he sits down and he goes, uh, holy shit, man. I can't get these guys to fly. And he goes, how are your students doing? I go, great. Aside from trying to kill me. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, my guys are going doing great. He goes, no shit. I said, no, nah, they're trying to kill me. He goes, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> oh, man, they're doing great. I don't know what your problem is. Okay, that's that's terrifying. Uh, I, I, I loved instructing. I, I loved instructing at the boat. I, I actually, I kind of miss it. It was, I like teaching. And, and our students were, you know, my wife, she's like, well, you should, you should flight instruct, you know, in Cessnas or whatever, because you like to instruct in the Navy. I was like, the guys we got have been vetted about a million times by the time they got to us, you know, to, right. to, whether they went to their commissioning source and then getting through that and then T2s, T30, all that stuff. I'm like, and they were motivated. So I was like, that the product I worked with was... And they were still trying to kill you. Imagine. <laughs> and, and even then, they would still occasionally try to kill us. Air show demo pilot. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, as we covered before, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I finished up primary thing going, hmm, I don't want Hornets or Tomcats. And that's when I got the news of... Oh no, you, because of this, sorry, you're out of the running, but we'll give you an E2. So I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder and kind of a frustrated, you know, wanting to go out and, and, and fly aggressive. And then I was in my first squadron where we flew aggressive. So, so I would, you know, coming into Fentress Airfield, if we were the first plane in, you know, I'd, I'd break at a hundred feet and low transitions and, Low levels and nice, you know. Any any time I could I could push the airplane, I'd, I'd push the airplane. And then so the previous demo pilot was a test pilot, TPS grad, and a great dude. Unfortunately, not with us anymore. Hollywood. So I did. I flew right seat with him, and he said, "You know, you should." He said, "I'm rolling out of here. You should look at put in your package to be the demo pilot." And I'm like, "Yeah, that'd be great." So he took me out and actually showed me some of the stuff they did at TPS, some of the really outer edge of the performance envelope, high angle of attack stuff with the Hawkeye. Okay. Uh, that was great. And so we're up at Andrews for an air show when I was a rag instructor. And we, in 124, we lost an E2 and all five guys. I mean, they might wave off, went bad. So one of the guys, they're all brothers. Us, one of the guys in the back, one of my closest friends in the squadron. He lived, he was from Maryland. So his mom and one of his brothers came to Andrews to see us. So on Monday, we were leaving the air show. His brother was there to see us off. And so I asked Andrews for a flyby. Negative. So I thought, all right. So I just go down the runway, suck the gear up, do a nice low transition. And next day at the squadron, I, one of the students who was in the back just went up with us for the weekend. She said, Hey, I think, I think you're in trouble. And <laughs> she said, the safety officer is asking me about our departure out of Andrews. And so anyway, next thing I know, I'm having a human factors board. And it turned out that, well, somebody narked on me for a break at Fentress and somebody narked on me for flying formation too close. And, of course, nobody said anything to me. They just ran and yeah. tattled. And so I go in to see the skipper, who's a good dude. And he says, hey, man, he's an NFO. He's like, when I, I see a shit hot break, I think shit hot. Yeah. Goes, but not everybody agrees. He goes, you got to know your audience. And I said, well, I thought I knew my audience, but apparently I didn't. And he said, well, you know, he said, once it gets to the safety officer, it's got to come to me and we got to put something in writing in case, blah, 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 you know, cover your ass. And I said, well, I guess this means I can forget being an air show demo pilot. And he goes, oh, no, so this means you're absolutely going to be my air show demo pilot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Perfect. So now I got to go out and do all the shit that I like doing. It was... 
it was great. And the, the guy who's my right seat, he went on to be the Commodore. And so I, I took the, there's an instruction for everything. So I found the instruction for the Hawkeye flight demo and it was pretty boring. So I said, Hey, Did you rewrite it? I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to kind of rewrite this thing in, in crayon for us. And I said, we're going to do everything. It says 500 feet. We'll do it at like a hundred and everything a hundred feet. We'll just, we'll drag the prop tips and uh, we'll make this thing look as good as we can. And, and he was, he was a bull rider before he came to the Navy. So this is, there's scarier shit out Speaking there. Speaking of lack of judgment. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. Correct. Yeah. So he just says, all right. And I... uh, so we, and then I scheduled a bunch of practices because, hey, we get the field from uh, sea level to 10,000 feet for 30 minutes to go rage in an E2. So let's do as many of those as we can. And uh, so the skipper, I told him, I said, well, when the Commodore comes over to sign us off, we'll bump the numbers up. So we come in from a practice and the skipper says, hey, the Commodore loves it. I said, uh, nice. come again? He's like, oh, yeah, Commodore came over this morning and watched your practice. So well, I guess we don't have to bump the numbers. Outstanding. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. So, and, uh, and here's what you find out doing, doing air, air shows. So if you fly in for a static display, you get... I don't know if you ever done air shows. Yeah, yeah. Had a ball doing them. They, yeah, well, it got the point, you know, in the later years where they give you, like, a drink coupon. So you get, like, two drink coupons in the air show tent. But if you're flying a demo, unlimited drinks. Right. <laughs> kind of ought to be the other way around, but, you know. <laughs> so make you want to come do it, I guess. So, no, that's that's fantastic. And then, well, I guess we're getting to the point here where we need to, we need to start thinking about wrapping it up. We 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 referred to the coffee mug just a little bit ago. That that was a little bit of back and forth. Part part of your temperament, I guess. And uh, here you get me, I'll get you back. <laughs> Don't bring the knife to a gunfight, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so what happened with the infamous coffee mug that hangs to this day on the shelf behind you? Well, we had a group of us. We'd work out every night on the boat, and so one night. I was sitting down on the bench. Buddy squirts his water bottle, makes a little puddle. I sit in it. And I said, why do you mess with me? You know I'm going to get you back. And he said, yeah, you're like a big kid. You got a one-up. And I said, you know that. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, and you know that, and you mess with me. And he goes, yeah, one of these days I'm going to take a shit in your coffee mug. And I said, well, I'll do the same to your rat. So the, the fly-off comes, so... Before a carrier pulls into port, they got to fly all the airplanes off because the ship's got to be moving to launch and recover airplanes. So they got to do it out in the open sea where the carrier has room to maneuver. So they fly all the the senior pilots fly all the airplanes off, and the junior pilots, like the former nav cads that are now ensigns, we have to walk off the ship with everybody else a day later when it pulls into port. So. I'm, this, I'm squadron duty officer, planes all fly off. I start packing up the ready room, cleaning some stuff up, and I walk to the back of the ready room where there's a big wooden board with all the coffee mugs hung in rows, and there's an empty spot where my mug should be. As soon as I see it, I'm like, I knew it. I opened the freezer, we had a fridge in the back, and there's my mug with a frozen turd in it. <laughs> so I knock it out. And, Get some of the scalding hot water from the coffee pot. I clean it real good and pack everything up. So I'm like, well, a promise is a promise. So I get the key to the six man because that was a, the senior guys from the six man. They'd all flown off. Their stateroom. Okay. Their stateroom. Yeah. Well, I can't remember. I get in there. I'm like, which I knew his, his rack was in the back corner, but then it was the upper rack or the bottom. Like I'm pretty sure his is the lower rack. So I, I fulfilled my promise to the lower rack. And so squadron shuts down for a good week after you get back from six months and everybody kind of reconnects. Was Amber heard on that boat? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're back in the squadron a week later and, and at lunchtime guys are going over to the piers cause we're at NAS Norfolk and the ship is, is peered over at Norfolk at the base. So, and, and during the course of working up and all the in and outs of the boat, you're, you you know you take TVs on and stereos and things like that. So now guys have to go over and start getting. I had a bike in my room and a trainer and all this stuff. So guys are offloading all their crap at lunchtime. 
One of her NFOs storms into the ready room. The door flies open. And she's, Some son of a bitch. Shit on my rack. <laughs> and I'm like, he's got the top rack. <laughs> yeah. And and so the 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 perpetrator who defiled my defiled my coffee mug, he's in the ready room. He looks across at me like he knows exactly what happened. He just goes. <laughs> So he goes off to pilot school. He he goes off to test pilot school, disappears for a year, graduates, comes down for a visit, stays with my buddy. I go, hey, Saturday pancakes at my house. So everybody comes over, want some coffee? Because I'm like, I shall not drink from this mug until he drinks from this mug. So I'm like, coffee, want some coffee? Yeah, I'll some coffee. So I yeah. take it out, blow the dust out of it, pour him a cup, hand it to him. And he's about right here, and our buddy who put him up to it Walks into the kitchen. It's like, hey, I said, recognize that mug? And he sees my squatter mug and he goes, You cleaned it, right? I go, I cleaned it. He goes, mm. Oh, well. <laughs> Drinks his coffee. <laughs> Bottoms up. Uh, <laughs> that brings back fond memories, Logo. Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you always have to have the good, uh, a naked story, a good poop story. Right? You know, yeah. Just, uh, what right. do we do as naval aviators? It's yes. it's required. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, Sluggo, thank you for your service and thank you for coming on with us and sharing this stuff with us. This is hey, fabulous. Did you do tw- did, did you retire from the Navy? From uh, reserves. From the reserves. Okay. I have how many years total? Uh, Twenty. Well, thank so, you for your service. That's indeed. awesome. There are plenty of plenty of good reserve squadron stories too. For, for another time maybe. come back and have yeah have come back do some more of those oh that'll be that was a, I, I bet yeah L- little little wilder even at the reserves i can only imagine well you, you know it's like rushing a fraternity going to right. reserve you right so you get to pick and choose everybody's qualified so it's like who do we want to hang out with and, you know occasionally guys like me will slip through the cracks but it was a, well there's that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, unlike an active duty squadron, a reserve squadron, you know, the, the, those people don't leave, yeah. right? Yeah. So active duty guys, they're, they're rotating out every couple of years. So if you have an asshole, that's okay. Yeah. You know, if you can't, if they can't get him moved somewhere where he can't hurt anybody, eventually he's going to leave anyway. And they pick and choose. Not a reserve yeah. squadron. Reserve squadron. They're going to pick and choose who they let in. Yeah. A lot of reputation and everything else. So, well, right. so we and, need and to have struggle. Guys- well, you got guys that are airline guys too, so you're gone a lot. So then to go to your reserve unit where it's it's not a weekend a month, it's at least a week to a week and a half a month because you got all your flight calls you have to keep up. Right. And so, hey, let's make it fun. You know, guys, guys so I, it kind of sucked to get home and unpack a bag and pack a bag, but, but then there was the upside. You knew you were going to see your buds and you're going to have, there's always a weekend party and there's always something going on. So it was, uh, right. it was a really enjoyable. And back and to what you said at the beginning of the show, you know, which is essentially if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong, you know, so yep. you've got to do this, yeah, got to have it. fun. So, all right. Well, thank you to all our military veterans and active duty and, and the families to support them in their mission out there as well. So we want to thank them. Any other thank yous you can think of today, Fig? Well, I, I think we need to absolutely thank Dave Hamilton. Absolutely. Yep. Without Dave, this show would not be what it is. It just it just wouldn't. So, uh, Dave uh, has a couple other shows, The Gig Gab, The Business Brain, and The Mac Geek Gab. And uh, runs a company called Backbeat Media, online at backbeatmedia.com. They handle all our advertising. We have a glossary out there in case we mentioned a term and didn't cover it and go circle back to it. So there I was, that US slash glossary. What if there's no term in there? They, they go there and it's not there, Fig. What would you do? I'd send an email to Sticks at so there I was dot US and say, what is this? Well, you can email repeat or myself, but if you really want a good answer, Sticks is the brainiac of the whole operation. Absolutely. So, <laughs> all right. And then there's uh, coming up on Christmas Eve, telling you that hoodie is warm, it's comfortable, and most importantly, it looks cool. You're going to look cool. And so there I was, hoodie, available at so there I was, dot US slash merch. And the fur line bikini's not bad either. Yeah, well, you know, there's that still. Still looking to try and get a watch cap, a beanie, a wool hat. <laughs> now that would be cool. Yeah, don't Especially have for those. bald guys. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you to all our Patreon pilots, all of you who 
take your hard-earned money and, and send it to us. We are humbled and deeply grateful. We can't thank you enough for doing that. That is amazing that you think enough of us to share it with us. Very humble. What else might one do if they think enough of us, Fig? Share the show. Right? Share the show and give us a five-star rating. Five stars. Count them five. 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 So there it was, that US slash rate. Oh, and he's watching today. Brad Silcott over at BDSAviationPhotography.com. Thank you for letting us use your images in association with the show. It is deeply appreciated. And let's see what else. Oh, speaking of people letting us use things, one of Brad's images behind me. But nice. other things that we get to associate with the show is some fantastic music. Fantastic music. Amazon Music, Apple Music, Spotify. Pandora. Anywhere you get your music. Those Gringos. Those Gringos. Go do it. These guys are Pretty fun, good. amazing music. Talented musicians, great pilots. Yeah. God bless you guys. Make, Thank you for... Make the Air Force sound good. They do indeed. They do indeed. Any ad advice till next week for our uh, listeners, Fig? Don't sit on the edge. Well, hold on a second. E2s don't have Stay a... Stay safe. And they don't have an ejection handle. They don't have a collective. They probably still want to check behind them. They're the Hawkeye in the sky. All right. But Stay safe and check six then. Do it. Crossing the pond And you could see that I wasn't exactly fond Of all the shit I was wearing On that day Now an F-16 is cramped enough But it's even worse With all that stuff Supposed to save your life But we knew there was no way Cause when you're going down The North Atlantic, man, it's over He said it It's over I blame society